Um, welcome to everyone here. I think I know all of you, but in case um, I don't know who you are, I see a name Nancy up there. I don't know who's who's the Nancy. She's muted. Okay. It's uh, it's it's the Philkins. I'm not sure why it just comes through. I registered oh. David and Nancy. Okay, good. I'm trying to keep attendance. So, all right. Thank you. And Sher Sherry Brenton. And the Cribs are on. Susan Morris, Joni, the Follinsby's, Carolyn and uh, Paul. Or I don't see Carolyn, but I see Paul. You're muted, Paul. <laughs> I'll join in a minute. Okay. Coming. All right. And Sue Fry's with us, Susan Morris. And in the room, we've got uh, Nancy McCabe, we've got Bob Young, we've got um, Julie Pritchett. Pritchett, Sharon Newman, and Bob and Jean Bell. So we may have a few more come in. Um, yeah, there's Nick. Okay. So I want to welcome everyone. Um, I'm so glad you're, you're able to be here. I do have in the room a handout that lays out the schedule for the next uh, four, well, for the four sessions of this class. We actually are going to not do the fourth session in December because it's, I think, like the day after Christmas or, you know, it's, it's going to be a break, but we're going to do the fourth, se uh, the fourth session on um, January, what's the date? Second. January 2nd. And um, I think that'll actually work out because that's the Magi. And so we're, we're you know, in, um, in that story at that time in our um, liturgical year. So I think this actually has worked off well that we've like started this a week later than the first week of Advent um, because we had Montford Brock with us last week. So, um, but today it lines up with the Zechariah story and I think it's, it's going to be uh, working out. Welcome. Um, to those, Judy and, and Eileen, who are joining us. Um, so if you are able to get a copy of the book, um, Amy, Amy Jo Levine's book, Light of the World, it, it has a, a lot more in each chapter than what we're gonna see in the video and what we can cover. So if, if you get a copy of it, you know, you might see things in there that we don't bring up in class, but feel free to bring it up. You know, if you read something that really spoke to you that, um, you know, made you think or, or questions. Hi, Betsy. So, um, no, that's okay. That's okay. We, we know that people are getting their, that are in person getting their, their coffee and, and their treats and probably engaging in conversation, which is, Good and those that are joining us on Zoom um, are there, and I, I've told them if you're in your pajamas, we have no judgment here. You know, <laughs> if you want to put your face on, that's that's good. Um, and let's see, Susan's iPad. That, I think that's Sue Kelly, Susan's iPad. Yeah, hi, it's Sue hi. Kelly. Okay. Yeah, it just says Susan's iPad. So when I don't see your faces, sometimes it's hard to know who it is. So Davis PC, is that Linda Davis? I can't hear her voice. You might be muted. Yeah. Well, we want to welcome everyone. So today we are beginning um, this four weeks series called Light of the World and Advent Study. Um, that is led by Amy Jill Levine. And for those of you who know her, uh, I know we've got the bells are here. They've heard her speak in person. Um, it, um, where is it that you've, you heard her? At Chautauqua. Chautauqua. And um, we, we've done another one of her studies uh, with our journey class on the um, Sermon on the Mount. That was maybe a year ago. The COVID, everything sort of blurs <laughs> in my brain. But Amy Jill Levine is, um, she's Jewish, 
and she is an author and um, professor of New Testament at the uh, and Jewish studies at Vanderbilt University. And in this study, she is going to explore stories around the birth of Jesus and uh, the beginning of his early life. And she's going to uh, explore how the chords in the first two chapters of both the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew um, can then be heard throughout the rest of their Gospels. You know, so they're kind of setting the stage with the telling of these stories of Jesus' birth. And they'll help us, um, as, as we go through this study, see how the Gospels are addressing political tensions in the early first century church. And they'll also help us understand some deep connections between Jewish traditions and the events of J Jesus' birth. So that's just a little yeah, introduction. Um, yeah, I did. A little introduction. I did, I did. Okay, now I'm hearing somebody. Oh, that's the Ryman's. Welcome. Panels are here. So let me get us um, started with an opening prayer. So if you would join your hearts with me in prayer. God of our past, present, and future. Yeah, I did. Well, I thought I did. If you're on mute, everybody please mute yourself who's doing Zoom. I would appreciate that. I can do that and start again. Okay. Can, if everybody would hit mute on your screen, that would be good. So let me start again with our prayer. God of our past, present, and future, bless our time together over the next few weeks and guide us as we learn and draw inspiration from those who came before us Help us live into the memory of all the ways that you enter into the world. Help us see the world in a new way in light of the stories of Jesus' birth. And may we benefit from the wisdom of your people and your word. Amen. So today our um, first session is called The Meaning of Memory. And we will be focusing on the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, which was our text for this morning in worship. If you were joining us this morning in worship, Don preached on, on that text. And um, we're going to be looking at Luke 1, verses 5 through 25, and Luke 1, verses 57 through 79. It is unmentioned in his sermon today. This story of Zechariah and um, Elizabeth kind of bracket the story uh, that Luke tells of the Annunciation of Gabriel to Mary. So we're going to look at just today the, the Zechariah and the Elizabeth portions of that story. This is going to take us back. Um, you know, this is a, a couple both in their later years in their lives past the childbearing age. Um, and they're going, they've had infertility and, um, as we hear their story, it's going to kind of transport us back to other Old Testament Jewish stories of God's people who had infertility issues like Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, and, um, other couples in Israel, Israel's, uh, scriptures who suffered from infertility. And in her book, Amy uh, AJ says that whenever you see in scripture where they talk about a couple who are having infertility issues, like be prepared that there's going to be a miracle. So I, I think, I think that's kind of, and, and she makes the point, you know, paying attention to like when, the, when the scripture mentions a name of a ruler or a time, there's a reason for that being mentioned that it, it's setting up some understanding that might, I think for 21st century people like us might go over our heads. So it, it's kind of like signs, like pay attention. So we're going to begin before we watch the video, um, reading the, the story. I, I don't know how familiar everybody is with the story, but I thought let's start by reading the story. We're not going to read 
to the end of it, we're going to do that part, which is Zechariah's song, um, a little bit later in the class. But before we watch the video, let's just read this the story. And if I could have volunteers, you'd be willing to read. Um, you know, if, if you're in the room, just raise your hand, or if you're on Zoom, just unmute and start. So I think it's all Paul. So if you want to read, um, I'll keep changing the screen, okay? Okay. Go for it. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both were getting on chair? in years. No, and I'll do the stool. I just move over. Sure. <clears throat> uh, Ryman's, can you mute your... Yes. Your, thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Once when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now, at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will, will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of, of Elijah, he will go before him to turn their hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did not come out, he could not speak to them. When he did come out, he, he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife, Elizabeth, conceived. And for five months, she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, no, he is to be named, called John. They said to her, none of your relatives has this name. And then began motioning to his father to find out what name he wanted to give him. He asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, his name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately, his mouth was open and his tongue freed, and he began to speak, praising God. Fear came over all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. All who heard them pondered them and said, what then will this child become? For indeed, the hand of the Lord was with him. All right, 
So there's our scripture foundation. I'm going to start us on the video. Fingers crossed that it works. <laughs> okay. I love Christmas. I like the candles. I like the trees. I even like the shopping. When I was a child, I used to go to my friend's house to help trim the tree. I had the best of both worlds. I got to trim the tree. I never had to put it away after the season. But I particularly love Christmas because I love the stories, the accounts, the different accounts we get in the Gospel of Matthew and we get in the Gospel of Luke and we get also from post-biblical church legends. I will sometimes come into church and people get very somber and serious because it's Advent. But if we do, we're missing something. Matthew and Luke are stories of joy and they're also stories of humor about an infertile couple who has a child and that's the birth of John the Baptist, about the annunciation of the angel Gabriel to Mary who says, Mary, you're going to have a child and Mary asks quite logically, how exactly is that going to happen? About Joseph who discovers that his fiance is pregnant and has a dream with an angelic prophecy from the prophet Isaiah telling him what to do. And those fabulous magi who aren't kings and they're not necessarily three of them, uh, they're Persian astrologers. They are figures of fun. They are fools for Christ. We need to see the profundity in the story but we also need to see the joy, the challenge, the exuberation to appreciate the story as story, a story that will give rise to multiple interpretations and a story that continues to inspire. The Christmas story in the Gospel of Luke begins not with Jesus, but with Zechariah and Elizabeth. And we first meet Zechariah, who is a priest in the temple. Actually, there were too many priests at the time to serve on a daily basis in the temple. So this might have been Zechariah's one shot at the big time. He's doing the afternoon incense offering, and suddenly an angel appears to him. He's stunned, but you know, this is the Bible and it can happen. And the angel says to him that, Zechariah, you're a righteous guy and your wife is righteous and your wife, Elizabeth, she will become pregnant. Zechariah somewhat discreetly says, um, well, yes, except I'm old and you know, my wife is getting on in years. And the angel, the angel gets a little bit huffy. Look, he says, I'm the angel. I'm reading here from the CEB translation. Zacharias said to the angel, how can I be sure of this? My wife and I are very old. And the angel replied, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the Lord's presence. And I can just picture the angel with this look on his face saying, what, you doubt? Gabriel continues, I was sent to speak to you and to bring this good news, this gospel, this oi angelion, this good news to you. Know this, what I have spoken will come true at the proper time, but because you didn't believe, you will remain silent, unable to speak until the day when these things happen. Poor Zachariah, he's just received good news, he's just received the gospel, and now he can't talk. But we have to worry about the professional situation as well, because following the offering, he is supposed to go out and bless the crowd. Here's how the CEB describes it. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zachariah, and they wondered why he was in the sanctuary for such a long time. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. Then they realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he gestured to them and couldn't speak. When the Gospels were first produced, they were read out loud, indeed performed to congregations. And the fact is a lot of people back in the first century were illiterate, they could not read. So I can picture so easily the storyteller explaining not only that Zachariah had been struck mute and through his gestures, 
he explained to the crowd what happened. But how do you do that? How do you do in body language the idea that an angel appeared to me? Do you, do you have wings? Do you have a halo? Do you have a look in your face? And the angel said, I'm going to have a baby? What was the crowd thinking when they listened to Zachariah and more fun? What was the crowd thinking, the, those first audiences, those first churches, when they watched the Gospel of Luke being performed? How do you proclaim the good news in sign language? The angel Gabriel had told Mary not only that she would conceive a child, but that her elderly cousin Elizabeth, who had been suffering with fertility issues, has conceived herself. So Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. The scene is typically called the visitation, and it's in the Gospel of Luke. Here's how the CEB puts it. Mary got up and hurried to a city in the Judean highlands. She entered Zachariah's home and she greeted Elizabeth. I do wonder if Zachariah is there saying, but she greets Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So we have this sense of quickening. Elizabeth feels life in her own body. So Elizabeth then filled with the Holy Spirit proclaims Mary's own pregnancy. With a loud voice, she blurted out, this is the translation here, but proclaimed is probably better. God has blessed you above all women and he has blessed the child that you carry. Why do I have this honor that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as I heard your greeting, the baby in my wound leaped for joy. Fabulous. Elizabeth here, although she's not called a prophet, is one. She recognizes from her pregnant cousin something more than just the good news of a pregnancy. She recognizes the mother of her Lord. She recognizes Jesus' role even before he is born. Zechariah, her husband, doubted the angel. Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, makes the correct proclamation, and Mary then responds. The Lucan Christmas story is filled with remarkable news, unexpected but urgently wanted, hoped for news. Zachariah is told that his elderly, infertile wife will bear a child. Mary is told that she will have a child even though she has not yet had sexual relations. We are told that this newborn baby will be not yet had sexual relations. Her hymn sings about status reversal, past, present, and future. Magic I see a star, the good news of the birth of a new king. Herod himself receives some news, not good, that his rule is illegitimate because the true king of Israel has just been born in Bethlehem. We have to be open to staggering news. And rather than just say, oh, that can't possibly happen, rather than have doubt, one of the beauties of the gospel is it helps us envision the world otherwise. See the world differently. Following the Gospel of Luke's four verse, very fancy introduction, Luke tells us, during the rule of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to a priestly division, and so we launch into the story of the birth of John the Baptist. Following Mary's visit with Elizabeth, Elizabeth gives birth, John the Baptist is named, and there's some fuss about this because they wanted to name him after a family member, but Elizabeth the prophet insists, no, his name will be John. And then the story of John the Baptist leads into the story of Jesus, but the setting is important here. For Luke, John the Baptist is set during the reign of Herod of Judea, locally, internally to the land of Israel. But the birth of Jesus has a slightly different setting. Chapter two in the Gospel of Luke begins, in those days, Caesar Augustus declared that everyone throughout the empire should be enrolled in the tax list. For Luke, Jesus is not limited to the people of Israel. To the contrary, his birth is set during the reign of a Roman emperor. 
And so we launch into the story of how Jesus was born not in Nazareth, which is where his family lived according to Luke, but in Bethlehem of Judea. So reflections, I want to give a little time to reflect on, on what we heard in the video. Um, the Luke and Christmas story is filled with, with remarkable news and unexpected but urgently wanted hope for news. And Zechariah is told that his elderly and fertile wife will, will bear a child. Mary is told that she will have a child even though she has not had sexual relations. We are told that this newborn baby will be Lord. Uh, Mary's Magnificat, uh, which we did not hear in that reading, but um, is her hymn that she sings about the status of reversal, uh, past, present, and future. And then the Magi, whose story we will hear later um, in the fourth week, we'll, we'll see a star, which is the good news of the birth of a king. So we're gonna reflect a little bit upon the staggering good news. So how is, how would you say this Christmas story is staggering good news? What would be your, your um, if somebody were to come up to you in the street who wasn't a Christian, you know, like, how is the Christmas story staggering good news? I thought it was about one a Christmas tree. What would you say? What, what's the staggering good news? If you are at home on a screen, okay, uh, Ernie Kimmel. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's staggering good news because it uh, has all these totally unexpected uh, things. I mean, the normal thing was, so no couple doesn't have a child and yet bang, uh, God intervenes and they're gonna have a child and then that moves into uh, Gabriel speaking to Mary. And uh, it's just one of perhaps the most visible sign of, of God breaking into human history. So that, that's how it's staggering to me at least. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else have thoughts? Uh, Nick. Yeah, I, I have one thought about the fact that it seems that you have a series of miracles here. And one miracle leads into another miracle. I mean, I think it's easier for Mary to believe um, that she's going to have this child after she hears what happens to Elizabeth and Zachariah. So it's like one miracle builds upon another. And I also think it's staggering because of the fact that he's coming to the world to save the world. He's the Messiah, the long predicted Messiah that the Jews have been waiting for. And it signals a whole change in the direction of the world. Mm -hmm. A change in the direction of the world. Thank you. What does this story say to us about being open to surprises and a world otherwise, a world different than what we know and expect. I'm trying to keep my eye open. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Judy? I guess the, the thing that comes to mind is just in the idea that each of these things that's happening is not at all in line with what anybody would expect. Not only the people that it was happening to, but everybody around them. Mm -hmm. This is not the way it happens. It's, it's, it's a different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it reminds me that despite the way we see things happening and assume they're going to continue to happening to happen because, you know, what else is, what, what else, what can change it? What can change it? 
and through God's power, as you say, there can be a whole different, a whole different world. Mm -hmm. Even I, if you think about the people, first of all, the fact that these two families had babies, the way the, the way the baby was named, the way John was named, totally contrary to what people would have done then. And I don't know how much has changed, but in her book, I think Amy Jo goes into detail saying how they pick the names for their children. Yes. And I have a good Jewish friend who's, she's always saying to me, well, now, Judy, you know, we Jews. And then she goes on to explain. And she's told me about how her grandchildren, her children's names were picked first. And it was, there was a rule about this. You did it this way. Yeah. So I, for those people that were the observers and the hearers would have had to have gone through their own period of doubt before they could see. It was staggering, certainly. Maybe the, the goodness of it came later. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good, good, good thoughts. Anyone else? Oh, Betsy. Well, the whole thing kind of, the whole story lies nature. Yeah. Because science and nature it just defies that. And it's like, how could it possibly be that way? Yeah. And I think that's always been, it's very hard to explain to somebody really that, mm -hmm. you know, they say, oh, well, that's just a story or that's a myth because that's not a possible um, thing to, a na natural thing to have occurred. How does, mm -hmm. how does somebody get pregnant without having sexual relations? How does somebody that's past menopause get have a baby? I mean, mm -hmm. how does that happen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's all, it all defies nature. Mm -hmm. And that's always been a question mark. And of course, we, as we believe the power of the Holy Spirit is there that mm -hmm. defies nature. I guess that's our part of our explanation. Mm -hmm. It is, it is, it, you know, you have to suspend that, what well, we know this is the way life works to say with God, anything is possible. Right. Did I hear another person? Carolyn. Uh, oh, Carolyn or, or Paul? Yeah, for me, the story speaks to hope, and, I, and, it's, and it's a story that we should hear <laughs> regularly. Yeah, I, I had that same thought. I was like, this is hope that no matter what the way things look, which you might feel like, I wish they were different, but it you know, can't be. It, it lives, gives you that hope that it could be. Um, there's, there's hope. What other parts of the video uh, stood out for you? Oh, er Ernie, I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm sitting here reflecting on how often the Christian church is sort of drawn a sharp line between Judaism and Christ. And yet here, Luke starts the story in probably the most traditional, in the Jerusalem temple. Mm -hmm. with a priest uh, offering a sacrifice that was mandated by Moses a thousand years earlier. Um, and I think whenever we're tempted to draw such a hard line between Judaism and Christianity, we need to re remember that the early tellers started the Jesus story, if you will, uh, in the temple that's and right. in the heart of Judaism. That's right. And you know, that's a perfect segue into the next um, slide. So this is a quote from the book. Uh, Amy, uh, A.J. Levine says, I regard these gospel stories as Jewish stories. And so part of my own history, uh, or so it's part of my own history as a Jew. Matthew and Luke quote Jewish sources draw on Jewish images, are set in the Jewish homeland, and describe a Jewish Messiah. And if we miss that context, we also miss much of the message. So uh, you kind of reiterated um, her point there. Um, so reflecting on Jewish stories as Christians, um, I don't know, I, I could be wrong. Is there anybody in this room or on the Zoom that you were raised in a Jewish tradition or home? I don't see anybody. Um, so what do you know about Jewish history? 
what, 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 what do you know? And Sue, Sue Fry knows a lot because she's got a PhD in. <laughs> 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 what do you know about Jewish history? So Sharon says she's attended a Passover Seder. How, how many of you have ever been part of a, a Seder before? I, I've had a chance. So for those who've been part of a Seder, what happened? What what's what is the Seder about? What what happens in the Seder? Do you remember? Well, it's the retelling of the liberation story of the people of Israel coming out of Egypt, of God liberating them, rescuing them. Yeah, and that is a key story um, for the Jewish people, but also for Christ. And, you know, it was the, the Seder, that's where he was with his disciples uh, in the upper room when they were gathered. And uh, in the midst of that meal, he kind of took uh, that bread and, and kind of, gave some additional meaning to it, which we carry uh, as a Christian community um, out of that tradition of the Passover. Um, so that's a very key story in their history. Any Anything else of their history? I have a great, I, I thought about doing it today, but I, I didn't want to take up the time. I have a great little video clip. It's the Old Testament in five minutes, which I, I share when I lead my new members classes, but it's wonderful the, 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 these drawings and they tell that like this overarching story of God's story through the, the Old Testament leading up to the Gospels. And um, there's a lot in the Old Testament in the Jewish scriptures. Um, there's a whole lot in there. And uh, where we are in what we call the New Testament um, is very short amount of time compared to what historic is captured in the story in in the old testament and i think we so often fail to realize that so much of what we uh hold as the way we should behave is, is rooted in torah uh and the, the commandments to the jewish people to love god to love your neighbor, to particularly to watch out, take care of the alien. Mm -hmm. It's like the immigrant in their in their midst to take care of the widow. All of that goes back to the very beginning of uh, recorded Jewish history. Mm -hmm. That's right. So AJ tells us that the name Zechariah comes from the Hebrew word for remember. So thinking about that, what um, events in history or church history or world history would you want to pass on to the next generation? Would you want them to remember and, and why? think of the bad things which we won't want to repeat like the holocaust and Amer slavery in america mm -hmm. so i'm not saying it's very positive but perhaps some other people in the audience have a, a positive thing they want people to remember oh, but that's 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 and, and why would you want that to be remembered because it will do it again mm -hmm. if we don't get smarter and more wise Mm -hmm. And we do all the time, people, will, human beings. Yes. Betsy. One of, one of the things that is so important to Jews in general is tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, you know, think of the famous play, you know, tradition, because they, they remember, mm -hmm. they celebrate these things every year to remember, to, to teach the young people what was what happened 
you know, to recount the stories. That's what a whole Seder is all, the retelling of all of these things, you know, every, everything on that plate has a meaning. And if this is the salt for the tears and on, you know, it goes on, but that it's the, re, the remembering. And we do it too, in that we, every year we remember, you know, this, like right now in, in Advent, we're remembering how we prepared the way for Jesus to come to, you know, his birth at the end. And, and what all the components were that had to happen to make to make it meaningful, and it's it's important to transmit that to the next generation, to, to other people that are maybe non-believers. Mm -hmm. um, and so we we recount those things, and we go through all those hymns and all the all that text in the Bible, and we recall this every mm -hmm. every year to remind ourselves and how powerful that is. We enact it in our worship. You know, we we enacted in our worship the way we um, make banners, which Betsy and, and Kathy made this the beautiful banner we have. We enact it in the choir, you know, in the anthems that they're singing and and the scriptures that we're reading, in the telling of the story to children and a children's message, in the preaching, and and also I think of like what we had today in the breaking of the bread and the sharing in the cup, you know, when Jesus out of that Seder of remembering also is saying how God is carrying on this delivering God's people through him. And he, you know, whenever you eat this bread and do this in remembrance of me. So we enact that remembering every time we, we break, the bread and, and share in that cup. Sue Morris. Sue Morris. Hi, it's Sue Kelly. I'm not sure if you saw my hand up. Go ahead. Um, back to remembering. Um, I'd like to see every generation understand, as one person mentioned, that remembering and teaching is so important. And I, my hope would be that there would be teaching about what Christmas is, and then the questioning of, is it going to the mall? Is it this? And, and having an awareness as the children grow of what is Christmas and what is not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, taking what is sacred and, and stripping away all the secular um, trappings that sometimes bury the sacred story. Yes, Next. and and Easter and everyone knows, yes. you know, I won't go on. Yeah. Yeah. Nick. I think it's really important to remember that Jesus was born and died a Jew. He may have started a movement which we would call Christianity today but he was very much a fulfillment of the Jewish literature. He was predicted, you know, long before Isaiah. Um, I mean, Jesus really came in some ways to actualize everything that the Jews had ever wished for and hoped for. And yes. of course, in that group, there were people who still deny it, still don't believe it, whatever their issues are. But the fact is he was a Jew he fulfilled their literature. He fulfilled the call of the Messiah. I mean, he really actualized everything that they had prayed and hoped for in their whole history. And, right. I think we, and we have to realize that in that sense, we are very much Jewish. I mean, we are very much a product of, of Jewish religion. That's right. That's right. I'm going to move us to the next. That's kind of a good segue into this, um, connecting us to that what, what we see in, in the Hebrew scriptures. Um, so in Luke's gospel, um, we hear references to John um, being in the spirit and power of Elijah. And then we wanna look back to um, Malachi, the prophet Malachi, who talks about Elijah um, and just seeing how do these, these two um, connect um, so would somebody be willing to read the Malachi passage out loud for us? I'll read it. Malachi 3, verses 1 through 
be happy to. Okay, thanks, Ernie. Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. Thank you. And would someone be willing to read aloud Luke 1? I'll, I'll do, I'll, yeah, I'll do Luke. Yeah. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Thank you. So how are these um, words from Gabriel spoken to Zechariah about John, uh, a rereading of the prophecy of Malachi? See it as a rereading of that prophecy. Definitely parallel. Yeah, there's parallel in, in it. So, how are the words from Gabriel to Zechariah? Um, what? How does Luke add to the prophecy and in, in, in what he says? Um, Gabriel says to Zechariah, "How how is Luke adding to that prophecy? Do you see?" I think what Luke is trying to say here is that he's, it, it's more than just a man coming into the world. He's going to, he's going to change things. Many of the people of Israel to the Lord, their God, some of those Jews who gone astray because they were so conservative about the law and thinking the law was the only thing they needed to do to be saved. And he's saying, that's not quite right. There's a spirit and a power that's coming. It's going to change the hearts of men and women and children. And it, he's going to clearly proclaim himself, which eventually does, as the Lord of the world. So there, there, in the Luke edition, there's that last line, to make ready people prepared for the Lord. So he, that's kind of the purpose of... Um, the spirit of Elijah and John is to prepare the people for uh, the Lord, for this coming Messiah who, who is going to be born uh, among them. Get them ready. Um, what does Luke omit from what Malachi? Do you see any way that Luke omits any, any of the emphasis in Malachi? Very striking. Oops, I used the word. But he will, mm -hmm. in Malachi, as he will not come and strike the land with a curse. I never noticed that. It's very frightening. Yeah. It's different. Absolutely not so hopeful. Yeah. <laughs> so Luke left that out. So how would you say, John the Baptist, um, what knowledge you have of him? Um, is equipped with the spirit and power of Elijah. What do you know? I guess here's another thing. What do you remember about the stories of Elijah? You know, there's a, there's a lot of stories of Elijah uh, in, in the Old Testament. Do you, what are some of the things that you can remember that were significant stories of Elijah? Anybody? He's the instrument of a number of miracles mm -hmm. to demonstrate God's power over um, the, the pagan gods around them. Didn't he hide in fear at one point? Yep. Mind you? Yep. But John never did. I think. Yeah. John. Wasn't, wasn't he taken up to heaven in a chariot? Yeah, he's he's taken up in 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 a chariot of fire while Elisha 
watched and so right. it, and then the, if Elisha saw that that happened then the spirit of Elijah would be upon him mm -hmm. so that, that spirit but yes so he was taken up um which was a much better ending than John had. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in the gospel of John, John the Baptist in, the, that, in that gospel, he says um, he is not Elijah. So how is John not like Elijah? So er Ernie just mentioned that. Yeah, he, he did not get taken up in a fiery chariot. He got beheaded. Right. <laughs> and, uh, taken in a platter to the queen. Jenny, could I make a comment, please? Yes. Go ahead, Sue. Um, the main thing that's happening here is in Luke is Luke is signaling in verse 17, Luke is emphasizing the spirit and power of Elijah like Elijah, it's going to have the spirit, it's going to have power. And that, and, but the spirit and power of Elijah that, that John has is to turn the hearts of the parents of the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, that that's what's being emphasized. So the Malachi passage is expecting some prophet figure like Elijah to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And when they say day of the Lord, that's that's a kind of a loaded expression because it can mean a time of disaster or a time of judgment. And, you know, sometimes sometimes like in Isaiah, it'll say in that day or on that day, what means, you know, well, that time, you know, it's kind of more not specific. So um, and the striking with the land of the curse, as we said, that's that's absent from it. So the idea here is John is going to have the spirit and power of Elijah, that nature in his ministry. That's right. Not make, Luke is not making John absolutely identical with Elijah, but he's saying that Elijah's going to come in that, you know, John's going to have that type of spirit and power. That's right. That's right. To turn the hearts. That's right. Yeah. And prepare uh, the people uh, for the Lord. I was a little wordy. Did it? Did that help or seem? No, that was good. Make sense? Okay. That was good. Okay. Um, so, how does the church help prepare its people to be ready for the Lord? How do we carry on that that spirit of how how do we help prepare um, God's people to be prepared for the Lord? Are we? <laughs> wow. well, if, we're, if we're like John, we keep pointing at Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not at ourselves, not at the institutional church, That's right. but at Jesus, you know, behold the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. Bob? Yeah, I, I think that happens every Sunday and I'm preaching with the gospel, um, which is the whole of scripture. And it's preparing us with the whole narrative. We do that every Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, if it's done rightly. Mm -hmm. I think most of you in the pulpit here do you in the pulpit here do that. We're trying. If we don't do that, let us know. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do. I think especially Don, because his mother always said, preach Jesus, Don. Yeah. Preach Jesus. Yeah. And he mm -hmm. does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not just what the pastors do. It's, there's a word there for all of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, <clears throat> this is Sue Kelly. Hi. Hi um, yeah, the, <clears throat> the idea of teaching and ongoing, you know, uh, um, adoration and recognition of who we are and our faith. <clears throat> I... Um, there's something that I, was strikingly different for me of celebrations uh, at um, a Orthodox rabbi's house. Uh, I lived with his, uh, the rabbi and his wife for a few months. So I saw seders and I was there for Passover. And there's 
um, and Sue Fry will know better, but there's a phrase, Baruch Ata Adonai Alekeinu Malakalam, which is something that starts every prayer and it's sung. And there's a melody within prayers. And particularly at Passover, there's many traditional songs that are sung at the table at different times. And that idea of remembering for children, you know, with song, I, I think is, uh, you know, something that's uh, very interesting, important. It certainly um, serves a great purpose, I think, for uh, carrying on, um, you know, the heartfelt spirit of what is happening at the table and what is being celebrated. Yes, yes. I'm gonna move us along just because I'm, I'm checking the time. It's like five minutes left till a quarter of. Um, so I, I wanna get to Zechariah's song. So if there'd be a reader who'd be willing to read this um, final portion of the scripture. Any volunteers? Bob, Bob Young, there we go. Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty savior for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke through the mouth, of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Thank you. So AJ writes in her book, Luke tells us that Zechariah, filled with the Spirit, prophesied, and in doing so, provides the assurance that despite the newness of the Christmas story, a rock-solid base provides an anchor. God is invested in history from the international level to the personal level. Um, so, you know, can you think about um, what action Zechariah's, um, or what do you think that Zechariah was expecting uh, to see and to happen? Any thoughts on that? What what you think he might have? What what does he think about, uh, or what does he insist about God's covenant um, with Abraham and Israel? Betsy, it, it occurs to me that a lot of this is about the evolution, the evolution of this. Okay, that we started with this and now we're moving on, and I think that's what Zachariah is telling us that we're taking all that tradition, we're taking all those things that we know to be, that we believe to be true, mm -hmm. and we're moving on to this next piece, this next level, which becomes Jesus eventually. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because people weren't able to understand beforehand what this was gonna be. So it took that, 
that gener those many generations to finally get to that point of that evolution. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, all the tradition that has come and gives us the background for what actually what, what is to happen. Mm -hmm. and with, uh, John and then with Jesus, of course. Yeah. See, he's drawing from this tradition um, and from this promise, this covenant God made with a Abraham um, that it's being enacted in their midst um, with with John and with the coming um, birth of Christ. I'm, I'm moving us along a little bit because I want to get to the very end here. Um, so central characters uh, in today's story is, uh, are Zechariah and Elizabeth. Um, question, why do you think that Luke chooses to begin his gospel with Zechariah and Elizabeth and not with Mary and Joseph's story? Why, why do you think he would choose to start with the story? To all three of those questions is balled up together. And I'm getting the impression that it's really foundational, that Jesus wouldn't have had a lot of people to speak to if John hadn't paved the way as he was exactly supposed to. It's a foundation for the whole story. Yeah. I'm thinking that it adds credibility, sort of a, a, a link, a persuasion to, you know, accept and, and move on with more information. It's a, it's a, a bridge and introduction to me. But it does underscore that Jesus is coming out of this long story of God working in the world that God remembers. And, um, you know, that, that frames the whole story without this being one more sign of God's love for God's creation. Um, you know, it would be a much weaker story, but it's said in this much bigger context. I loved Amy Jill's contrast between John's story is set in the reign of Herod, mm -hmm. but then Jesus' story is set in the reign of Caesar Augustus, broadening the scope of the story. Yeah, I thought that was a very interesting point. Yeah, and that, that's what she says, you know, these mentions of rulers and times, like there's more significance to them than I think a lot of us realize. So, Herod's mentioned in John, which is more the local, but with Jesus, um, um, the emperor is mentioned. So this implication is like way bigger is for the empire. It's not just for um, this tight knit group of, of Jews. Bessie, I saw you had your hand up. I was just going to say, I think to piggyback on what Arnie said and also what Sue said is that Zachariah was an established priest. Mm -hmm. So he was already in the power structure or the accepted persons. And then, because who was Mary and Joseph? Yeah. They were yeah. nobodies. And here, all of a sudden, this credibility of them leads people into saying, oh, well, if they thought this, then it must mm -hmm. be so. And gives the Mary and Joseph credibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well. And it did strike me, I've never thought of it this way. He asked who who were the people that first recognized Jesus? He probably said, Oh, the shepherds. <laughs> Those first to hear that. And she said that Elizabeth proclaims Mary's own pregnancy, and she's the first to recognize uh Messiah there. I yeah. never thought of it that way before. Yeah, isn't that isn't that striking? Yeah. I, that that caught my attention too. I think oh go, go ahead. I think another thing that caught my attention is that uh, uh, the baby in her womb uh, responded to Mary and they said he, he had the Holy Spirit before he was even born. Yeah. And that's a, that's a calling that we can remember as children of God, that we are chosen before we ever, before we're ever born. That's a good, good insight, you're right. Yeah, so not only did Elizabeth recognize him, but the baby in her womb, John, yeah, left recognized. 
So AJ writes in her book, seeing the angel Zechariah is, she says, terrified. And, and the word that is used, terasso, implies um, being shaken up. So Zechariah is shaken up when this angel appears to him. And she says, this sense of being shaken up is Advent good news. Advent should give birth to something that shakes up the routine, something that gets us to see the world otherwise. That shaking up is what it means to follow Jesus and to love. And so, you know, you think Luke is telling this story at the beginning of his gospel, but it, 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 there's implications of this story that he's setting up for the rest of his gospel. So this being shaken up is how he begins this gospel, but this Jesus who um, is coming into the world is going to shake up the world. And, you know, so he's calling disciples to love their enemies, which is scary, or to take up our cross, which is scary. But, you know, remembering back to this story of being shaken up, you know, this is kind of, she's, he, he's, Luke's preparing us for this message um, that Jesus is to bring. Um, Luke reminds us there is a legacy that carries us forward and a promise that God will remember the covenant and bring about eternal justice. I, I just really liked that, that oh. thing out of the, the book um, there, how she says, you know, he's setting us up um, for the rest of this gospel. Um, that there's implications in it. Um, it's the same word that was also used um, for King Herod, when he heard the news that the baby was coming, that that same word, um, Tarasso, he was shaken. So Amy Jo mentioned, you know, like he was hearing that he's not the legitimate king. There's a, there's another king. Um, that same term was used in Luke um, later in the gospel in the 24th chapter, when Jesus meets these two on the road to Emmaus. And um, Jesus asks them why they are startled shaken up by what they've heard has happened to Jesus. So um, that, that word, you know, will carry into other characters. Um, but the sense that this gospel is what God is doing in Jesus is going to shake up the world and is shaking up the world. And it's beginning, you know, with John, with um, Zechariah and, and uh, Elizabeth's story as he, he tells that story at the very beginning of the gospel. Any last comments or thoughts, uh, insights before we close? Just one thought that I have, and it's about Herod. You know, Herod's always portrayed as this really sort of evil guy. Um, but I don't think he's seen as evil in, in some Jewish tradition. You know, when it came to Masada and all those Jews were on top of that plateau trying to defend against um, the Roman legions and they held them off for a year, Herod was one who designed the water system to get the water up to the Jews. Herod also was a great architect of this and developed many um, aqueducts and other things that he was ahead of his time on. But I think what the point about Herod is, is Herod represents the old Jewish tradition, very conservative tradition, the tradition that really like the Pharisees sticks to the strictness of the law. And I think Herod being brought into this is to say that even Herod and the Jewish traditions are going to be shaken up. It's going to be a new beginning. And of course, a lot of Jews weren't prepared for that. And certainly the conservative Jews didn't want to hear it. But I think Herod's an interesting character to study because he's not all bad as, as we kind of portray him, but he is very conservative and he was trying to keep the status quo. Well, I, he's pretty evil. <laughs> <laughs> and he did some good things. But... Yeah, he killed all the kids, you know, when he heard there's another king, you know, and so. I guess everybody's got a little good in them, right? <laughs> we got a little good in them. And I also think you have to see it in the context that he's trying to keep the status quo. He didn't want so, them to shake it up. So let me, um, before we go, um, next week, Anne will be teaching the class. And um, 
What does your paper say? Next week is the pro uh, promise, and potential. the promise and potential. So, um, it, like I said, if you have the book, I think it's worth getting because there's she has a lot more that she shares in the book than we see in the um, video itself. But uh, Anne will be uh, facilitating next week. Chris Clark will be the week after that, and then I will do the January, be leading the January uh, session. I, for those of you who are joining on the um, screen, I'm going to try to send you the same sheet that I put out in the room here that just kind of has our schedule uh, the upcoming weeks. And, and you did that already. Oh, did I do that already? Yeah. yeah. All right, then you yeah. all have it. All right, never mind. Thank you for- I was wondering if you had something else on the chairs. No, no, that's the, what it is. Same. That's what it is. So you have that. Okay, good. Yeah, you know, get, still getting my head wrapped around, you know, some are in person, some are there. So I, I'm glad I remembered to send it to you. <laughs> um, those who I thought on Zoom might be on Zoom. Um, if somebody on Zoom did not get it, send me an email and I'll be sure to send that out to you as well. So um, is there someone who'd be willing to lead us in our closing prayer? Because I have it, the words on the screen. So um, anybody? Okay, Dean, thank you. God of Advent and Christmas, Thank you for coming into our world through the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Let us hope with their faithful hope for what may seem impossible. We are thankful for your many gifts and sing your praise. As we travel through this season, let us be mindful of your presence and your will. You who hear the prayers of all, lead us in peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Glad that you could all join us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I think I